Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, your source of information for living the best years of your life, your way. For more than a decade, host Jim Brogan and his expert guests have come together each week to share important news and advice that can impact the lives and well-being of those who are retired and those nearing retirement. Learn about issues like health and fitness, financial planning, social security benefits, investment advice, and more. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Tennessee. Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Federal income taxes and the national debt. That's what we're going to review this morning. Uh, I've got a lot of people calling me on a, almost a daily basis asking me about where tax rates are going. You know, our government, and it, with, with the pandemic, and there are a lot of parallels in our history, especially after World War II. It's a different kind of war we're fighting now with the war against this virus, but there's a lot of similarities in terms of how our government reacted and has reacted historically. And many of you have asked me, you know, Jim, where are income tax is going in the future? How are we going to pay for all of this? So, you know, this year we've spent, we've thrown, in terms of money, we've thrown at this problem economically. When you look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet, in other words, printing money and putting that cash into circulation through the banking system, and you look at what Congress has enacted in terms of federal stimulus, you know, we've spent close to $7 trillion this year in fighting this problem. Now, the $3 trillion roughly that the Federal Reserve has injected, that's not debt. That's expanding the money in circulation. You know, you hear the phrase quantitative easing. But we've spent a lot of money. And you know what? I don't think we're finished now, as it is a, a very apparent, we are not going to pass, and pass another federal stimulus, it looks like, prior to the election on Tuesday. But we're going to have another federal stimulus. I don't know if it's going to happen in the lame duck, duck session or whether it's going to happen in January, but we're going to get more stimulus. And I'll be honest, I don't think that stimulus is probably going to get us through to the end of the economic effect of this pandemic. We're probably looking at an additional stimulus deeper into 2021. I think we're probably going to get two stimulus packages, regardless of who's elected. And we could be looking at, uh, you know, anywhere from five to seven trillion dollars of more spending between now and the end of next year from Congress alone. And that doesn't count the Federal Reserve. So, you know, asking me about the future of our income tax rates is a very, very important question. In terms of federal tax revenue, we're very low today as compared to other times in our history. So I think it's reflective and very powerful to review briefly our history of income taxes and how we got where we are now because in a lot of ways history can repeat itself. Is it going to repeat itself, you know, from the, what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s? You know, I don't know. But, you know, there are a lot of similarities. By the way, uh, you can follow us online at broganfinancial.com. And uh, I'm going to be posting a video blog on this very topic of the history of income taxes. But we've got a lot of blogs, video uh, blogs already posted. If you go to my website at broganfinancial.com, click on resources in Brogan University. Uh, we've got a lot of great video education on there. You know, if you look at our history, think about how our history even came into existence. It was because of taxation without representation, right? That's what led to our independence and led to the Revolutionary War. Now, in the early days, excise taxes were the way we raised money for the government. And it was primarily taxes on whiskey, uh, well, really all forms of alcohol and tobacco. Now, there was a whiskey tax and a, and a rebellion on the whiskey rebellion and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into all that. But the idea early on was to tax things that were not necessarily good for you. Now, of course, that's different today. But that's how it first started. Now, when we think of the first income tax at the federal level, we think of 1914. 
and we think of the 16th Amendment. But in fact, the first income tax was officially born in 1861 to help fund the Civil War. And it was a 3% tax on income over $800. And then that tax rate was eventually repealed. And then 10 years later, it was repealed 10 years later. And the federal government went back to supporting itself by taxing mostly tobacco and liquor. And uh, then in 1894, Congress attempted to implement a flat rate income tax in that year. And the Supreme Court declared that it was unconstitutional. And the reason is because there was a stipulation in the Constitution that taxes had to take state populations into consideration. You know, how much population is in each state. And if you think about the original wisdom of that, you know, and you think about the system we have now, for example, we have a minimum wage. Well, I mean, it's kind of silly to me that the minimum wage in Tennessee is the same as the minimum wage in New York or in California. You know, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think our Constitution was probably on to something with the, with the idea that populations could affect maybe taxes. But then we, we had the 16th Amendment that basically removed the requirement uh, from the Constitution to look at state populations in determining taxation. So in other words... You can, run, you can have tax rates that are the same across all states. And then it was ratified by the, uh, it was ratified into the Constitution or, you know, in, into our documents in 1913. We had the first income tax in 1914 that's here today. That gave birth to our tax system. Now, when we started our income tax system, you know, you had to make over $3,000 in 1914, or you didn't pay any income tax. And then if you did make over 3000 you know, you would pay a whopping 1% income tax. And it was a one or two, pa- it was a two-page income tax return. That was it. There were no schedules, attachments, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I like to call it the Full Employment Act. The, the, the Internal Revenue Code, I like to call the Full Employment Act for CPAs and attorneys because it really takes a Ph.D., you know, or a CPA to really understand the tax code. But it started out very simply in 1914, and the highest tax bracket, it was a marginal system just like it is today, and the highest tax bracket was 7%. If you made over $500,000 in 1914, your anything over the 500000 was taxed at a whopping 7%. And who made that kind of money in 1914? I mean, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers. But we opened up Pandora's box. And now we have this very complicated tax code. And I've got a couple of interesting things. And and I'm going to get into what this really means for you. But I think, and, and how you can plan for this most importantly in your financial planning, and how important it is to even have a plan that includes a tax plan. But first, I do think it's it's important to understand our history. So, you know, when we had World War I, initially tax rates were still very, very low. As I mentioned, in 1914, the highest tax rate was 7%. And then they spiked up to help fund World War I. And then in the roaring 20s, income rates went way down again. And the highest income tax rate for the latter part of the Roaring Twenties was under 30%. Well, then the Great Depression hit, and there was increases in taxes in response to Depression-era deficits. So we had, in other words, think about this. We had bigger deficits. We increased tax rates. And I'm talking about the highest income tax rates But if you go back and look at history, all income tax rates went up and down and were highly correlated. So, yeah, the lowest tax rates didn't go up as much as the highest income tax rates. But all the tax rates across the board here went up. And rates climbed through the 30s. And then, of course, we had World War II. And tax rates got to the highest they've ever been in our history. And you may not realize this, but our highest income tax rate was 94%. And our highest income tax rate for 18 years following World War II was over 80%. 
And for most of those years, it was over 90%. Because we had huge deficits, we ballooned the federal debt, and the debt in 1946 was the highest it's ever been in our history until, guess when? Right now, this year, because of the pandemic. It's, it, it was never higher. If in the way, by the way, we should, the way we should measure that is by looking at how much do we owe compared to the size of our economy. That's the only way that we can relatively judge how much debt we had in the 60s versus now. So it's debt to GDP. Debt to GDP in 1946 was 121%. And so our tax rates were abnormally high. And they were all higher. It wasn't just the highest tax bracket. Now then, we had a Tax Reduction Act in the, in the early 1960s that was passed to boost the economy. And the federal debt had already come down quite a bit. So what we really need to be thinking about here is, what does our tax system look like as opposed to our, what our federal debt levels have looked like? And when debts have been very high, after World War I, at the beginning of the Great Depression, and then after World War II, our tax rates went higher. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying what's the best way to raise tax revenue. I'm just looking at what we've done historically over the last 120 years. And then tax rates started to come down. And even in the 70s, the highest income tax rate was 70%. And again, all income taxes were higher for all rates. And then in the 1980s, it was 50%. And then the uh, the Reagan uh, tax rates, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, lowered tax rates to historically low levels in 1986. And they went down again under George W. Bush. But, but, but let's, again, think about what was happening with the debt. The debt was at all-time highs in 1946. And the debt came down, and so tax rates eventually came down. So there's a lot of important stuff we need to learn in looking at that. Because when our debts and debt deficits have been highest, tax rates have gone up. So what is likely to happen in the future? Where are we likely to end 2020 in terms of our debt? And what is likely to happen in 2021? And what does this mean? And then how can you plan for it? Stay with us. You can also check us out at broganfinancial.com. Click on our resources tab for my latest guide, which is the election, federal stimulus, and the stock market. When we come back, we'll talk about where we're headed with income taxes likely and what you need to be doing in your financial plan. So don't go away as you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You are listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. During the week, Jim is a financial advisor, an author and speaker with an MBA from the University of Tennessee who specializes in helping people in or near retirement plan for the next phase of their lives. You can reach Brogan Financial during the week at 865-862-6800 or on the web at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living. Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Uh, I'm Jim Brogan, your host. And hey, I've got some exciting news. Beginning next week, in addition to running from 9 to 10 o'clock every Saturday morning, we're also going to be running Saturday afternoon from 3 to 4 right before the best of Rush Limbaugh. So if you can't catch our show uh, in the morning or you hear part of it and would like to hear the rest, uh, we will be re-airing our show that we do live Saturday morning. We'll be re-airing that from 3 to 4 Saturday afternoon. So be sure to check that out. Uh, Also, um, I want to ask you a very important question. What are you doing to save on your income taxes? Your income taxes are the highest expense you and I will ever pay in our lifetimes for most of us, you know, working Americans. Uh, 
What are you doing to reduce those costs? And where are our tax rates likely to go in the future? Because they're likely to go up. And that's what we're talking about today. But if you would like to, to have a retirement tax analysis, we can help you with that. Give us a call at 865-862-6800, and we'll help you with a retirement tax analysis. It'll be a complimentary consultation. We can look, I can look at your tax return look at what you're doing with your investments, how you're drawing income or how you're projected to draw income. How can you take advantage of that sweet spot between retirement age and age 72 when you have to take minimum distributions from your retirement accounts? How can you take advantage of this low tax environment we're in now? So call us at 862-6800 or you can visit us online at broganfinancial.com and you can send us an email to uh, to uh, schedule a free consultation to do a retirement tax analysis. Now, we're talking about our tax history, and I've got an interesting uh, thing here, and it's, you know, I mentioned we started our income tax 1914. The, uh, the 16th Amendment was ratified in 1913, and we became, a, we, we started our income tax uh, rates. And it was a very simple tax return back then. And I've got a chart here from efile.com, and it's kind of interesting to me. Back in 1955, like how many words are in our tax code? You know, we know. You think of how thick the tax code is. So in 1955, in our entire tax code, federal income tax code, there were less than 500,000 words in the Internal Revenue Code. Today, just over 2 million. So in the last 60, 70 years, our tax code has grown by about 450%. And it's very complicated. And then as I was mentioning, the, the most important thing to understand is that if you look at our history, when our deficits have gone up and our federal debt has increased, we have increased our income taxes. After World War I, uh, after, during the Great Depression, and most notably after World War II. Well, our federal debt after World War II did come down, but since the 80s and 90s, it's been just going up, up, up. Now, we are likely to end the year at a higher debt level than we had after World War II because of the economic uh, impact of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and what our government has done to help the economy. And that doesn't even, when we talk about federal debt, that doesn't even count the extra money that's been printed by the Federal Reserve. We're, so we were at 121% debt to GDP after World War II. And at the end of this year, we're going to be between, we're going to be in the 120s, maybe 120. We don't know yet where we'll end up, but maybe around 125% debt to GDP, but certainly between 120, 130%. Next year, or between now and the end of next year, I think we're probably looking at anywhere from five to seven trillion dollars of additional stimulus, probably around two to three trillion shortly after the election, regardless of who's in office, and then probably additional stimulus into the middle part of next year because of the effect of this pandemic. So by the end of this next year, we could be over 130 percent debt to GDP or even more. So, you know. Anytime this has happened in our history with financial crisis, when our deficits have ballooned, we have increased income taxes. Now, on our current tax code, income tax rates are guaranteed to increase in, in 2026 because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expires at the end of 2025. So they're guaranteed to go up. But that's, but they're still in 2026, going to be historically low if you look at our history, like I just was talking about. So our tax system in the 20, you know, 10 years from now is likely to be very different than it is now. And, and frankly, we could be looking at a complete or, or a large overhaul of our entire economic system over the next five years as we adjust to these new debt levels and we look at how we're going to pay for it. And then we look at with the Federal Reserve, you know, printing a massive amount of money. What does that mean for inflation? All these things. Now, as I said, 
Very similar things happened in nineteen in the late forties and fifties. With income tax rates, with Federal Reserve policy keeping rates in interest rates intentionally at all time lows. So what does that really mean for you? It means that your tax plan may become one of the most critical things. You know, when when I look at a financial plan for retirement. And I don't mean just while you're retired or once you're retired. I mean now, too, if you're still working. How are you planning for future income tax rates? How are you taking advantage of potentially low tax rates today as compared to where they may be tomorrow? You know, the, your investment plan, you know, there's five pillars of a comprehensive financial plan. Your, your investment plan is certainly as important as anything. And how you deal with how do you invest in a low interest rate environment with bonds being so unattractive now for the future. Your income plan is is just as important as your investment plan. How much income can you draw from your savings in retirement? And just as importantly, where do you draw that income from? What investments? Then your tax plan is maybe right up there as, as just as critical because not only is it your largest expense you'll ever have in your lifetime, but tax rates are going to Fundamentally, maybe, I mean, we don't know, but more than likely, tax rates are fundamentally going to change in the future as we see uh, probably a revamping of our entire economic system, including our tax code. And so what do you need to be doing? Now, then the other two parts, I said there's five. There's estate planning. How are you going to take care of yourself while you're alive when you cannot take care of your things on your own? It might be temporary. It might be permanent. And then how are you going to you take care of your loved ones. You know, if you own something and you love somebody, you know, you need an estate plan. Uh, and then, of course, there's health care planning. How are you going to plan to pay for health care costs and also the rising threat of long-term care? But the tax plan is going to become more and more important. So let's talk about some of those things. Now, when you're in your working years, you know, your income, more than likely, your taxable income is a good bit higher than it'll be once you're retired. So, you know, things like Roth conversion, where you take some IRA and you convert it to Roth and you pay the income tax now, and then, you know, you wait five years, you can, you can draw from your principal within the five years, you just can't draw your interest. But then after five years, as long as you're over 59 and a half, that money becomes income tax-free forever, you know, for as long as the account exists when you take the money out. Uh, those are very, very popular, and, and the Roth IRA is a great thing. But Roth IRAs are also overdone. You know, if your taxable income right now is a hundred and, you know, if you're a married couple and you're at one hundred eighty, two hundred, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, $225,000, you know, and your taxable income in retirement is going to be 100000 or 80000 you know, even though tax rates go up, it doesn't mean your rate will be higher because your, your income will be lower. So, one, don't go overboard with this. But the reality is, if you're in a 20, a, a, you know, let's look at our tax system today. We got a 10, if you look at our marginal brackets, you got 10%, 12%, then it goes to 22%. That's a huge jump. Then it goes to 24%, and then it goes to 32%. All right, then 35, 37. That's, those are our tax brackets today. Well, if you're 22 or 24, those brackets, and 12, 10 and 12, of course, as well, those brackets are likely, especially 22 and 24, not only are they going to go up in 2026, I think they're likely to increase dramatically in the future. So there's this idea that if you can, you know, especially once you're 72, you're going to have to take minimum distributions from your retirement accounts. And your taxable income, you're going to lose some of your planning opportunity because you're forced to take these roughly 4% taxable distributions from your 401ks and your IRAs and other retirement accounts. So, you know, if you've got a $2 million retirement accounts, you know, that's an $80,000 taxable distribution. So you're going to lose some of your control when you turn 72. But before then, if you can fill up brackets and intentionally create income tax at 12 or 22 or even 24 percent, it might make some sense. Likewise, you could maybe take, take advantage of the zero percent capital gains tax rate. 
So I want to take, when we come back for our, from our break, we're going to get into specifically how can you intentionally create either zero or a low tax, a little amount of tax today, to then avoid tax tomorrow. That's what I want to talk about in the next segment, so don't go away as you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Through his weekly radio show, television news appearances, and adult education classes taught at the University of Tennessee and Mississippi State Community College, Jim taps into his extensive knowledge and experience to address issues important to living your best retirement. Join Jim every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI and visit him online at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Thanks for tuning in. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And what are you doing to save on your income taxes? And what do you need to be doing in the future to save on what may be higher income taxes? That's what we're talking about today on More Living. Uh, If you would like a retirement tax analysis, I'm happy to look at your tax return. You can come into my office or we can visit virtually. Uh, We have a secure way for you to upload Uh, your tax information, and we can look at what you're doing, what your income is now, what it's likely to be in the future, and how can you be taking advantage of what today really are low tax rates? How can you take advantage of the 0% capital gains tax rate? And I'm going to get into that today in this segment, but if you'd like a retirement tax analysis specifically about your returns, uh, please give us a call, 5862-6800. Again, that's 862-6800, or you can visit us online at broganfinancial.com and click on a link to email us and ask for a complimentary review. Just put retirement tax analysis uh, in the notes, and we're happy to do that for you. Also, beginning next week, we'll be I'm, I'm rerunning this Saturday morning show, which comes to you live every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. We'll be rebroadcasting it every Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock from 3 to 4 p.m. So if you don't catch it all or you miss it one Saturday, uh, you can always tune in at 3 o'clock as well. We'd love to uh, have you uh, join us as we try to bring you information every week to improve the quality of your life. Now let's get into some specifics. So I think it's under important to understand our history because when our deficits have been higher and our federal debt has climbed after World War I, Great Depression, World War II, our tax rates have gone way up. And I think over the next five years, and certainly 10 years, we're likely to see some fundamental changes in our economic system as we react to debt being maybe as high as 130 to 140% debt to GDP, maybe by the end of next year. So, you know, what does that mean for future income taxes? And taxes are the largest expense you and I will ever have in our lifetime. So let's talk some specifics. You know, the real opportunity, or the biggest opportunity, let's say that. There are opportunities, if you're in the later years of working, there may be opportunities for you. And if you're in your 70s and taking minimum distributions, you'll have to start that back next year under current law. Uh, you, You know, there's still probably things you can do to take advantage of tax planning. But the real biggest opportunity is that sweet spot between retirement age and age 72. So let's say you retire at 65 years old. You know, you've got seven years there. When you turn 72, you have to take taxable distribution from your retirement accounts, IRAs, 401Ks, 403Bs, and other retirement accounts. And it's about 4%. So if you've got a million dollars in your retirement accounts, that's roughly a $40,000 taxable distribution. Two million would be 80,000. So, you know, you're going to be forced to take that And, you know, you're going to lose some control. Now, again, even after that, many of our clients, we've been able to help with tax strategies even deep into their 70s and 80s. But your biggest opportunity is usually prior to 72 because, you know, if you retire at 65, you don't have earned income. And if you're smart about how you invest your money, you know, when you invest your money, there's potential tax implications. Does the investment pay interest? Does it pay dividends? Is there a capital gain distribution from a mutual fund or an ETF every year in December? 
if you sell off a, a, a stock that has a gain. You know, there's tax implications on your investments. So how do you invest your money? What, what investments do you put inside your IRA where you don't worry about investment taxation while it grows versus investments that are outside your IRA or 401k, which do have implications? And then how do you draw your income and where do you pull it from? You know, if you draw it from your 401k, it's taxable income. 100, probably 100% of it is, or, and it's ordinary income. If you sell off a stock that has a capital gain, well, part of that is tax-free because it's your return of tax basis. And then the gain is a preferential tax rate. So you can be very intentional about the taxes you pay once you're retired. Your social security strategy can affect your income taxes. Because if you delay social security, not only do you get an 8% increase in your benefit every year you delay to age 70, but that's less money that you're getting a 1099 on. That is less money that has to be reported on your income tax return. And there's this one gift in the Internal Revenue Code that is even greater than Roth, and it is the tax treatment on capital gains. And specifically, the 0% tax bracket on long-term capital gains. You may not be aware of this, but we actually have a 0% tax rate in our Internal Revenue Code. If you're a married couple filing jointly, and your taxable income is under $80,000, now that's after, remember, taxable income is after your tax deduction. If it's under 80000 any part of that that's long-term capital gains is taxed at zero. So then it goes to 15, then it goes to 20. And then there's also the 3.8% surtax from the, uh, the Affordable Care Act that can kick in if your investment income's too high. But bottom line, gain harvesting, intentionally creating capital gains at preferential tax rates is a wonderful, wonderful thing in the Internal Revenue Code. I mean, if you're in a 12% tax bracket, that means your long-term gains rate is zero. You know, if you're in a 24% tax bracket, more than likely your tax rate on long-term capital gains is 15. So those are big differences. So how you invest money to take advantage of long-term capital gains is very important. One of the things that we've been talking to people a lot about recently is I can't tell you how many people have come into my office and they don't have any ability to take advantage of long-term capital gains tax rates because one of two things has happened. Either they've saved almost all their money in their IRA or 401k, in which case everything coming out is ordinary income, or all of their non-IRA money is invested in things that pay interest, you know, things like bank monies, which are taxed at, as, as interest, and they're, they're not taking advantage of the ability to have long-term capital gains. In other words, asset location. Where are your investments located? If you have capital assets, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, real estate, if you have capital assets and they're located inside of an IRA or 401k, you do not get long-term capital gains tax treatment. But if you have capital assets, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, if you have, if you have capital assets that are outside of an IRA or 401k, you have the ability to take advantage of long-term capital gains tax treatment. And that is such a great thing in our Internal Revenue Code. So tax location, where do you, or, or excuse me, asset location, where do you own your assets? Are they in the IRA or are they not in the IRA? And being aware of, of this great thing in our internal revenue, called, called, internal revenue code called long-term capital gains is critical in, an, in a tax plan and in a financial plan. Now, you know, I'm not a CPA. Please don't get me wrong. We don't do tax returns. CPAs largely is, it do an exercise of looking in the rearview mirror. They're always looking into the past, okay? Because you're filing your taxes. It's for the prior year. You've already got your 1099s. Those things have already happened. Tax planning is looking to and, and understanding how to position things to be intentional about the taxes you pay.
An asset location, where you own your different investments, where do you put your CDs, where do you put your, your bank money, where do you put your mutual funds and your stocks, where do you put all that stuff? Because you want the ability to take advantage of these long-term capital gains. Now, there has been talk, if you look at the tax plan for Biden and Harris, there has been talk about removing the long-term capital gains tax treatment. Okay? And, you know, regardless of who's elected, we're probably going to have some changes in our tax system. You know, how likely is it this gets taken away? Well, anything can happen. All we can do today is take advantage of the opportunities we have today. I do have here a chart that shows me of all the federal tax revenue, what are the different sources of that tax revenue on a federal tax basis. And overwhelmingly, like over 80% of our taxes come from uh, it, personal individual income taxes and Social Security taxation, you know, payroll tax. And then the next biggest item is corporate income taxes. You know, that makes up over 90% of our tax revenue. So in other words, everything else, investment tax, interest, dividends, capital gains, estate taxes, it makes up a very, very small piece of the pie. So in other words, changing tax rates on capital gains is not likely to have a meaningful impact on our tax, on our debt problem. So, you know, how likely is that? I don't know. What happens to the filibuster in the Senate? We just don't know. All we can do now is plan based on the tools we have and be aware that taxes in the future are going to change. And so we need diversification. You know, it's interesting. We talk about investment diversification. But what about tax diversification? You know, it's great to have things, you know, 401ks and IRAs are great places to accumulate money, but they become problematic when you want to take money out because they're taxable. You know, some sources are tax-free, Roth IRA in particular. Roth IRAs are great, tax-free. You know, capital gains tax treatment is a great thing. We should have all these different tools in our arsenal where we invest intentionally, take advantage of different tax Benefits, You know, an IRA gives you a tax or 401k gives you a tax benefit up front, but you're taxed later. Roth IRA, no tax benefit up front, but then you're tax free later. Capital gains, no tax benefit up front, but preferential tax treatment later. And no, under current law, no tax on gains at death. So, you know, there's just a lot of ways to take advantage of our system. We don't know where we're going in the future, so diversifying the way we invest inside of the IRA versus outside of the IRA, and the way we do capital gains, both gain harvesting and loss harvesting every year, the way we do our charitable planning and our charitable contributions, all of this is so important. So if you're close to or in retirement and you don't have a tax plan, I would urge you to get one. You know, it could mean hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout your retirement. Our country has been spending money really like never before, and I think the tax bill is coming. At Brogan Financial, we build tax strategies into retirement and investment plans designed for you to keep more of your money. So take action and schedule your retirement tax analysis today. Give us a call, 865 865- 862-6800. After World War II, taxes reached over 90% and were as high as 70% in the 80s. Don't be caught off guard. Brogan Financial, give us a call to schedule a virtual or in-person tax analysis. That's 865-862-6800, or you can visit us online at broganfinancial.com, and you can email us for a complimentary review. Just put tax analysis in the field. When we come back, We're going to talk about the other parts of a comprehensive financial plan and why that is so important in today's world. So don't go away as you listen to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. If you miss any of today's show or want to listen to it again, visit BroganFinancial.com where you can access the podcast and other educational materials to help you in your journey through retirement. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year, 
and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Thank you for tuning in on this Halloween morning. It's More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Next week... Be, f- be sure to join in not only at 9 a.m., but also at 3 p.m. as we'll, we'll be live at 9, and then we'll rerun the show at 3 from 3 to 4 p.m. just so you have a better opportunity to catch the show. We're going to have Ken Keyes on next week. He is a Washington, D.C. insider, and we'll you know, know what's going on with the election. Do we have an outcome? Do we not have an outcome? What's likely to happen? W- how does it affect federal stimulus, taxes, all these things? Washington insider Ken Keyes. And uh, don't miss that, as we'll be doing a review of where we are and where we may be headed uh, after the election. So today we've talked about the importance of tax planning. If you'd like a tax analysis specific to your situation, we can look at your tax return and what you're doing and how you can minimize taxes both now and in the future. Give us a call at 865-862-6800. Again, 862-6800. Or visit us online at broganfinancial.com. You know, I mentioned invest, a financial plan in retirement is not just about investing your money. I mean, that's very important. But let's talk about all the different things you need. Just real briefly here. I'm about out of time. I went a little bit over on that last segment because it was so important. You know, I've talked about tax planning today, but investing our money and the challenges we have today is, is we have such a low interest rate environment. And so, you know, using traditional bond investment is not going to be very productive, in my opinion, the next 10 or 15 years. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have any of that in your portfolio. But if you don't have a plan for diversification and risk mitigation that uses much, much more than just traditional bond exposure, you need to be assessing that. How can you minimize, not just be invested in the stock market, so you're not that volatile and risky, but not have this exposure, this traditional exposure to the, to the long-term impact of, long ter- of bonds in a low interest rate environment. It's a huge challenge for today's retirees. Then there's the, t- there, you know, how you draw income, where do you draw it from? It's so critically important. What if you retire into the teeth of a bear market? And then your estate plan and your health care plan. All of these things are so critically important. If you have not done a comprehensive financial plan or you want a second opinion on your financial plan, I'd be happy to meet with you. We would at Brogan Financial. You can, we can either do that virtually or we can do it in person, whatever you're most comfortable with. Give us a call at 865-862-6800. 862-6800. You can also visit us online at broganfinancial.com. Click on resources. We've got many resources up there. We've got Brogan University, which are video blogs on important topics. We've also got our, our guides that you could download. And again, you can get all that at broganfinancial.com. Thank you to Chris running the board today. Thank you, Jill, for helping produce the show. Be sure to catch us next week, both at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. next Saturday, as we have Ken Keyes, a Washington insider, and we talked about the outcome of the election and where we're likely headed. So, so have a great week. You've been listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.